She's a doctor. Hi, I'm Dr. Dovek, and she's a dietitian. Hi, I'm Hannah Schuyler, and together we are the Dr. Doctor dietitian, dietitian Collab. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Dr. Dietitian Collab. We are so excited to be here. Oh, my goodness. This has been something we've been talking about, thinking about, and we are just really pleased that you are here listening to us today on our first episode, Beyond the Blonde. Ooh. So this podcast will be a space where we talk about so many things regarding health, nutrition, weight, bariatric surgery, and just so much for so much more. But before we get to that, please allow us to introduce ourselves. Sure. So my name is Dr. Betsy Dovek, and I am a bariatric surgeon. I have been doing this for over a decade, and I am so passionate about this space, about this community, and really about increasing awareness about bariatric surgery and really why it can change your life and empower you to really live your dreams. And Hannah? Yeah, I am a dietitian. I have been practicing for about seven years now, but as a bariatric dietitian for just about a year, so that's very exciting. And it's just been such a wonderful opportunity. I've so enjoyed entering this world and just learning, you know, jumping in feet first and learning so much and seeing our patients succeed has been just absolutely phenomenal and life-changing. No doubt. And we really want this podcast. We're in this little intimate space right now. It has pink lighting. We are just chatting with each other. Hannah is so cool. I can't wait for everybody to get to know her. And we're going to get personal. We're going to get personal because we feel that for you to connect with us and for us to become someone that really resonates with you and potentially even hear a soundbite that changes your world, we feel like we have to be just totally open and honest with our own stories of of struggle and how we've like overcome them to be where we are today. Absolutely. And and going off of that, I know that you have some stories from your days um, coming up in this field and being a surgeon and being a woman and being a blonde woman. Like, can you talk a little bit about some of those experiences that you've had? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you might be wondering, why is the first episode called Beyond the Blonde? And, you know, many times in my career, I have gotten from people who find out what I do, why would a patient want to go to you? They probably can't stand you. I mean, you're blonde and you're they're skinny and you don't get it. And well, first off, um, the way I look should have nothing to do with it. Um, and Hannah is also blonde. And the two of us um, felt like that comment is just, what does our hair color have to do with the way that we treat patients and, and really... Um, in the value that that we bring to this specialty and and even to this world, I think it has nothing to do with our sex, our the way we look, our skin color, our hair color, our body habitus. It doesn't matter, right? And, and that was something that was brought up when we had a, an event going on a while ago. And literally every day of the event, someone commented on your hair color, <laughs> and I was like, so she could do this presentation if she had brown hair or red hair or short hair or like. It just drove me crazy. And I remember even growing up being told, like, you're, you're probably going to be treated differently because you have blonde hair. And I was like, I mean, awesome a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, but then at the flip side, it's not because you do. There's the dumb blonde jokes and there's the – it just it, – it, I don't know. I don't understand, like, why they think, like, this color seeps into our brain or something. I'm like, no, just just how my genes work. Like, exactly. you don't say I'm stupid because I also have blue eyes. Like – no, they just kind of go hand in hand, you know? Totally. And we're going to tell you stories of how we got here. So first off, there is comparison is the theft of joy, my friends. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that many people look at our Instagrams. My Instagram is at Dr. Dovek. And I, I think people look at it and like, man, this girl has a perfect life. There's nothing that has ever gone wrong with her. She's gotten everything. And just one day, miraculously, I have this busy practice and all of these patients that I, you know, really gel with. But it's it's not like that. So if you know what the training is to get to this point, it's brutal. It's straight up brutal. I, uh, I went to college and then I went to medical school and then I do residency, which is this time and space that somewhat have blocked out. It, it is a, a crazy time. It's five years. It's general surgery. I'm doing things that have, a lot of them have nothing to do with bariatrics. I have to do trauma and breast and vascular. It's super long shifts. I work 30 hours at a time, 80 hour work weeks, much longer than that a lot of times. And it is a male dominated profession. And it was really hard. I had a lot of imposter syndrome where it's like, 
truly like, why would anybody want to come to me? There's times when you're learning, when you're like, I, I'm not good at this. Like, will I ever get good at this? Even though you might think like doing surgeries, like doing video games, it is not innately in you. It's not intuitive at first. It takes a lot, a lot, a lot of practice and a lot of patience and a lot of frustration and disappointment. And then ultimately, you're getting better and you're picking up steam. And I know um, in your profession, it's a little bit of a of the flip side of, of that whole thing. Yeah, it really is. So, you know, to become a dietitian, if you don't know, basically you have to have your bachelor's in nutrition of some sort or you have to take certain coursework. So I did that, took an extra year of school to finish some of that. And then you do a supervised practice internship, um, which I did at Tulane. It was amazing. Definitely recommend living in New Orleans as a 24-year-old. <laughs> um but dietetics um, is predominantly female and to the point where it is uh, – the one of the stats I found was that 92.1% of all registered dietitians are women. Whoa. Um, so 79 are, are men. Wow. Which is, I mean, just absolutely crazy. And, of course, then it changes – then you look at how many of those are white women. It's 70% or so is wow. white um, and then and then other ethnicities follow. Um, what's crazy in that, though, is that in all of that, men then become considered a minority and they get paid more. Mm. So female dietitians, even though we make up 92 percent, we make 93 percent of what male dietitians make on average. Wow. And it's because they're funneled into certain specialties. A lot of them go into food service management because men are seen as directors. They're seen as managers wow. and all of this stuff. They don't. Of course, there's clinical male dietitians out there, and they're fabulous. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with male dietitians. It's just one of those things. But it's very opposite of what you did. And I think that for me, it's been the advocacy of fighting more for our profession rather than having to fight for myself. Like you kind of had to, mm -hmm. you know, keep keep that strong, you know, passion there and everything going to get you through the program. For me, it's been like, okay, how do we get this position so that we are seen as the person of power, you know, this, the person to go to, we're seen as this position of respect that we're a female dominated field. Like people don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. And so now, and then I read this last night and I was like, are you kidding me? The men are still making, you know, I think I knew it in the back of my head, but I was just like, even in this, we're still making less than the men. Um, I mean, when you talk about being seen and, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be a lot about this podcast for everybody is about visibility. Yeah. Um, you know, a patient told me this, and this is in the opening remarks of the, the keynote that, that we gave at the um, bariatric retreat. I said, have you ever felt like you were the largest person in the room, but yet you were invisible? And I think we're going to share moments where it might not have been based on my size or my hair color or my skin color or my sex, but it might have been that I didn't feel visible. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I hope that from this podcast, people listening will feel like I can be invisible. We see you. Mm -hmm. We hear you. And you are worthy. I mean, you are worthy of all of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where this kind of comes through. And, and when we look at, you know, people out there who are struggling with obesity, I think that's just such a common thing that they feel invisible. Um, going back a little bit to the pay scale thing, um, women with o who are overweight and obese or have overweight and obesity are paid on average 4.5 to 11.9% less mm. than people of like a quote unquote normal weight. Wow. Um, and, you know, that comes from you know, a lot of different things, but a lot of stigma. Um, there was actually some research that's saying that underweight people got paid even more. Wow. And which is insane. Um, it, men, it didn't have the same impact. It was a little more wishy-washy, but in women, it, it had that pretty distinct, um, dist you know, there was this distinction there. But, you know, thinking about why is that? Maybe you are feeling more insecure about getting up and doing a presentation or speaking up in a meeting or just having that confidence that comes from, you know, you've been hiding your whole life because you feel invisible and you feel that you shouldn't be seen, maybe. Mm. Let me tell you a story. So the date is July 29th, 2013. It is my very first day of my first big girl job. So after I did residency, I went to fellowship after fellowship. It's time to get a job. Here we go. A J-O-B is coming my way. So I got a job as a 100% bariatric surgeon in Baltimore, Maryland. 
And the way that we use it, thank you. I, I, I got a job. Yes. Spoiler alert. <laughs> and so um, I was, the way that we got patients at that time was through an information session. And so some of you out there who've already had surgery, you're like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So what these were, if you are not familiar, is they would be in person. This is pre-COVID days, 2013, almost a decade ago. They went to a hospital auditorium, a little conference center room there, and patients would literally sit there with or without their family and friends with them, and they would learn more about bariatric surgery. And so I knew that when I showed up to work the first day, I kind of thought that I was going to have like a book of business because when you're in training, like you show up and there's cases on the schedule, like you don't really think about how you get patients to trust in you and come to you. So when I got there, it's like zero patients. Fair enough. I have to do this information session and I hopefully will be dynamic enough that the patients will want to come to me. So at the time, my male partner, he introduced me and he was the director of the practice. He was established in the community. It was a little community hospital. Some of you have had surgery with me there. You know where I'm talking about. And the first day he introduced me and he said, Hi, um, I'm the director here. Hi, I see some of you. Uh, There's some of my patients. Oh, yeah, you know, a little, a little audience connectivity there. And then he said, "This is Dr. Betsy Dovek, and she has, um, she is right out of fellowship, and she has never operated um, on a patient before. And hopefully, one of you in this room will be her very first ever patient." And it was like. Ah! like the screeching record, like, oh my gosh, like that wash of shame. I don't know why I felt that way. Like I felt like numb. I felt frazzled. My presentation was awful. I had had worked on it. I read books about how to give a good presentation. After the presentation, we're standing by the door and um, patients are kind of filing out. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Go ahead. If you're interested, please sign up here. People are signing up. Everything is going well. And so then the crowd finally dissipates. And now it's time to look at the sheets to see, did I get anybody to sign up for me? And I'm looking, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there. Okay, I'm flipping through the pages, flip, 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 flip. And I saw that there were 53 signups for him. Oh, my God. I got zero. And in that first moment, I I got a wake-up call that I was like, stop being anything other than yourself. Mm-hmm. Be unapologetically true to who you are. Connect with people as humans as you do. Be authentic. And ultimately, we did become one of the busiest practices in the United States. And already here, since we've moved to Florida, we are already um, becoming the one of the busiest practices. So um, it was a very early on lesson, lesson one that rattled me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's been really, to me, from what I've, what I've seen in the last year of knowing you, of you are so authentically yourself. I mean, we always talk about Instagram and I think that's where you get a lot of this and also follow us on Instagram. Um, but, you know, you don't hide your your life. Your kids are on there. Your husband's on there. You're at Disney. You're at the pool, you know, whatever it might be. You're in your pajamas with your kids, <laughs> like, you know. Um, and I think that that's something that you know, regardless of who you are, I think it's so important to just be yourself. And whether you're a blonde person or not a blonde person or you struggle with obesity, I think it's, you know, something that it's it's important to, that's Mm -hmm. the lesson. It's kind of like, you have to just be authentically yourself. And that's what's going to bring you the good, that's going to bring you the success. Because you could have gone there and and said, no, I've been this demure person. And I think that's what a lot of people do is they diminish themselves because they feel maybe that shame spiral or they feel that like, well, I'm not good enough for anybody to sign up. And it it's it, rather than going out of yourself and, and out into the world, you, you tend to close up. And I mean, the fact that it's been nine years and you've grown, I mean, phenomenally in the last nine years since that moment in time is, you know, just speaks volumes about being yourself and being a blonde, tall blonde woman. Like, just do it, you know? Just do it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Totally. And I hope that, um, you know, my favorite TED Talk ever is by Angela Duckworth. It's on grit. I talk about this all the time. So I'm sorry if I'm redundant to some of us out there listening. But it's about grit is defined as having the passion and perseverance for a long-term goal. Every day, waking up, chipping away at it posting on Instagram, writing somebody back, connecting with a real friend, having fun, Um, but understanding that it's not going to all be um, rosy. It's going to be tough. You know, know, I'm going to share with you what would be um, undoubtedly 
um, probably like one of the worst moments of my life. And um, it was really, um, it's still probably, it, it's still the hardest patient moment that I ever had. In 2014, I had a patient who was a young guy. He was in his 20s and he weighed 850 pounds. And um, he had like a 200 pound like lymph edema esque tumor on his leg and it was just really, really hard. And he, um, we did the surgery, went perfect. And then afterwards, he he went into heart failure and, and he actually passed away. And they called a code blue and I was in the hospital and I heard this and I was like, oh my God, like I was super close with this guy. This guy lost a hundred pounds even um, to, to have the surgery. And, um, and, and that was my only death. People ask me all the time, do you have any deaths? And it takes me back to that, to that moment. And it was just extremely hard. But at the same time, I think sometimes we forget that you, are, you know, you're not just a dietitian. I'm not, I'm not just a surgeon. At that same time, I had been undergoing um, treatments for IVF, and I'm also very, very open about. You talked about my kids and sharing those things, and, um, and my kids are just such a vision of like hope. I think for a lot of people because I struggled with IVF and I went through many, many rounds of it, of egg retrievals and it not working, and it just all that sadness that surrounded that whole thing. But but in this particular time, I had already had the um, – I was undergoing the two-week wait. I had already had the implantation. He died. I was distraught. I then developed horrible chest pain, horrible, horrible chest pain. I went to the emergency room. And when I was in there, I um, the ER doctor came in, and it just tells you about being empathetic always. I and mean, you just don't know what people have going on. And that, I think that's what we do when we're, we're connecting with our patients is just like, man, listen to their stories and all of this. But anyway, when when um, the doctor came in, he was like, well, I have good news. At least you're not pregnant. Oh. And he I just didn't realize that that was um, – not good news, actually quite the opposite. And it was really um, so tough. And I was just, I had pericarditis, I got, I think from like stress induced, I was just so like overwhelmed from that and, and like a lot of things. And so like, I'm in the ER, horrific chest pain, broken and shattered. Like that was my first time trying IVF. And I thought, oh my gosh, like the mother load of like treatments didn't work for me. You know, like how can this be? And in that moment, one of the people that worked in the ER was my patient. And I had the gown on and it was like not even really like covering me completely. I was just so vulnerable and just so sad. And my husband and I are kind of holding each other. And anyway, she comes into the room. She's like, Dr. Novak. And she like flings the drape across and open. And she, um, and she sees me. She's like, look at me, I'm down 50 pounds. And I was like, that's awesome. But, and, and, and it was just like, it was like the flip side of it. Like, wow, I am so fused with my work and that like my patients are like my original baby in this whole, you know, thing is always that. And, um, but I picked myself up from that moment of sadness and I kept going on and researching and thinking and doing. And ultimately millions of needles later, I have three kids and we all know that. And I just, um, and I think that that is, unfortunately, some of us are just not, you know, we're, we're not blessed in certain areas. And I think that the, to tie this back to, you know, your weight, and I think the struggle with obesity that people have, sometimes it's like, man, like, you don't get it. It's true. You know, like a lot of people just don't get it. They don't have the genetics. They don't have um, some of the lifestyle upbringing, some of those things. But I think that we're, we're here to tell you that you too can have the hope that you can, you can live the life of your dreams. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's, you know, I mean, what, what an impactful moment in your life, like that just roller coaster you were in. Cause it's like, you had this successful surgery, you think it's successful. Mm. And then it just goes the absolute worst way it can go mm -hmm. and not through anyone's fault i'm sure you know it's it's the risk you take especially you know with that many issues going on and then to find out like oh good luck good news the thing you've been trying really hard didn't work you know and that man didn't know and again it's be compassionate for people. Maybe don't say that not being pregnant is always not good news, you know? Right. But then, you know, it is. It's seeing that person that came in and was just, like, so happy that you're there and such, you know, so supportive and has made that, like, life-changing decision for them. And, like, just what a, what a roller coaster. And I think that's what we deal with a lot of times, too, is people are on this, like, wild ride and they've gone through so much to get to sitting on the other side of that screen from us to say, I'm here to get this done because I've gone through this whole journey 
Mm. And this is this place it's brought me. And I think that, you know, I know that you and I are, when we're in our sessions and we're talking to people, we're we're try- sharing that, showing that compassion and talking them through this. And again, it's there's no shame in it and there's no, it's all neutral. Mm. You know, I think we put so much value into different things and so much in life is truly neutral. You're, you're, you're coming to us for help and that's fine. And that's, that's, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just, it kind of is, It is, you know, and we're here for it. We're here to support it. Absolutely. And I think that the only way that um, people like you more and you'll be ultimately more successful and happier, I think a more joyful life is when you, you, you do get vulnerable Mm -hmm. and, you know, looking at, we talked a lot about we're 100% virtual and been that way for all oh, this. March will be three years. That's a crazy thought. Like the pandemic has been going on for three years. That's another thought. But, you know, looking at um, when people are in their own home environments, we've talked a lot about whether that be at home, at school, at in their cars, at work, and, you know, just taking a walk outside while you're on the phone. You know, I've seen it all. I've, I've seen it all. The nail and salon. The nail <laughs> salon. I love that. I'm like, get it, girl. You know, like, just, you know, do do uh-huh. you get your health and your nails done all at the same Absolutely. time? I think it's, it's, it's perfect. But I do think that we have heard countless stories of vulnerability mm-hmm. of people telling us when they felt invisible, Mm -hmm. when they were a victim of abuse, when they were, um, you know, like these stories of just feeling ashamed at work, of not being where they want to be in life, of um, losing themselves. I mean, how often do you hear patients are like, I don't know what happened. Like I having kids, I'm running them around, my partner, my spouse, my work, my colleagues, all these things are happening. And somewhere along the lines, I lost myself. Myself, my own self became invisible to even me, and um, and I hope that we we teach people, we tell people that by having surgery is not a selfish act. Mm-hmm. By looking into your own health and prioritizing your own needs is something that is essential to give your best version of yourself to this world, and and that is um, and that's something that. That I do. I mean, every day, you know, like, what are the tips to success? And, and and I would love to hear, you know, what you feel like you're doing. You're at a different part of your life. Hannah is planning a wedding oh, I'm here gosh. soon. Oh, my goodness. There's that whole dynamic. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I am a mom of three kids, married, running this practice and, and doing all these things. But, like, how do you intentionally not lose yourself with all the chaos that is life? Yeah, I think that that. One, it came from knowing it comes from knowing yourself. Um, when I lived in Chicago, I went through I was going through a really rough breakup and I had about a year where I lived by myself. And I think in that moment, in that time of time and space, I really like got to know myself. It was the first time I ever first and only time I've lived without a roommate, without a partner, anything like that. And um being really intentional with what I was doing. I took the time, I cried, I did the You know, I had my cats. My cat was like my support system. Um, You know, spent the time on the couch, did all of that. And then I was like, you know what? I need to go out and I need to make friends. So I really intentionally went out and made my great girlfriends that I have still. Um, And and so knowing that that's part of what I need is to I need to take the time for myself to be to feel my feelings. I feel feelings really deeply. Mm -hmm. Um, But then also knowing that I need to go out and I need to find the support of other people and I need to have that connection with other people. Believe me, after a week of, of work from home, I am like often like bouncing off the walls. My poor fiance is an introvert. So he's like, please let me just stay home. And I'm like, no. Um, But I think that that just really having that idea of what is important to you, what do you value, and then putting it into action. And and that for me can be the the hardest part is the action step. that's why it's great working with you because you're just like, okay, we're going. And I'm like, oh, okay. We booked the studio to record a podcast. And I'm like, wait, I need to make more documents. Like, oh, get on Canva, make a logo. Yeah. Up. We're wearing these cute little We've t-shirts. Got t-shirts. We yeah. got our t-shirts. We got the logo. We got yeah. the pink lights. Yeah. But, but it's, it is, you know, I feel that is part of our job. Like we are on, like all of you out there, you're standing on the edge of a cliff and you're like, okay. When is the right time to jump? Let me think about well, maybe next week I'll be more ready. And we're like behind you, like, go! And yeah. like we just like push you. And um, and then don't worry, the parachute will open. We'll make sure that you are fully equipped to um enjoy the descent. And yeah. that is that is something that it takes a lot of courage to think about, like, you know what? 
I'm going to have surgery. I'm going to rearrange my anatomy. Like, okay, that sounds frightening. Absolutely yeah. frightening. But then I see like, okay, they did it. It doesn't seem that bad. It didn't, they look at the results. Like, will it work for me? You know, like all this self-doubt and self-think. I hope that this will help to kind of like level set you to realize that you can truly pick out a good dream, climb up on the operating room table, go to sleep and wake up on a mission. And um, and that's what this is about. Like, How do you maintain the fire within you if you've already had surgery to keep on that mission that got you up there in the first place? The whole, the phenomenon of the why, like why do you want surgery? Why do you want to change your life? Like why is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to constantly instill in our patients and in ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think there's you always, and that's that's the other thing that comes with it is you gotta like really know why are, why are we doing this? What is the purpose? What is the reason? Um, and and just knowing that if you can if you can always come back to that because you can stray and you can get off path and there may be weeks where it's not as easy or you don't go to the gym or you don't do this that the other but it's like always coming back to that that level and saying okay why did I why am I here and what's next and what does this opportunity provide for me. Um, and hopefully as we move on with um, with the podcast, we are, you know, kind of tackling some of these ideas and we're getting it deeper into, you know, all the things about not just the basics of bariatric surgery, which we will absolutely cover next podcast, but, um, you know, thinking through what is it about you as a person and what what else in your life is important and and has brought you here and and we can support that and and be there for you. Definitely. We're going to dive deep into relationships. Relationships you talked about making friends and with other people. We're going to talk about having relationships with food and other things that we use to cope and um, dealing with our feelings and feeling all the feels and um and being present and like being mindful and, you know, being able to have fun. Um, I think that that's a key to life that, you know, when we're on our phones and we get, you know, down these rabbit holes, we lose. And a, a true, another great, I'm going to quote constant a podcast, masterclasses and books because I'm constantly trying to improve myself. So I read these things like nobody's business, but I saw a pot, I saw a TED talk on fun and it talks even about like, what, what does it mean to have fun? It means that you're truly being playful you are like in the flow, like you're you're like you're just like in a good vibe and energy of your life. And finally, you are connected with others. And I hope that you can connect with us. I yeah. hope you feel that connection. Absolutely. I love that. I'm all about fun. That's my other ethos, I would say. It's like Oh, you're the most fun. If it's not fun, like what's the point? Who knows? I'm going to tell you guys, Hannah is so fun. She's so carefree. She jumps into a pool and gets her hair wet. Like that to me is just like a little <laughs> bit like mind blowing. Like the way she'll just jump in there with my kids, toss them around, get her hair wet. This hair thing, that's a whole other thing. I guess we're coming back, back to the blog. Back to the blog. Here we go. Maybe it's, I'm, I'm doing it to myself. Perhaps. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should just go brunette. No. No. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. No, definitely I'm going not. blonder in Blonder a couple for the weeks. wedding, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Maybe we're going to have a bunch of blonde followers out there after yeah. this. There's going to be so much bleach. There's going to be a shortage of bleach after this podcast. I think that that's our, our our ultimate goal of this podcast is actually just to make everyone blonde. There you go. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Secret but yeah, it. no, I think that I think that it, to me fun is like go go all in. You know, if you're going to have fun, have fun. I always hate when they say, "Oh, you're having too much fun over there." Like, what? What does that mean? What's too much fun? I These mean, are jealous. The word too, I think we could do a whole, but we'll do a whole episode on just like too much. Because what does that mean? Again, you're too blonde. You're too tall. You're too this. You're too that. Too too compared to what? Exactly. Yeah, there's no, no such thing as too much fun. Definitely not. No, we're going to we're gonna dive into some, like we said, we're telling a lot of stories. We're going to tell some, uh, some patient stories, our own stories, how they apply, and then give you all those um, necessary tips and tricks that you need to um, have some practical advice. Mm -hmm. Hannah is a world-renowned dietitian. <laughs> I mean, seriously, she. we're going to be doing some episodes on some amazing like substitutes, things that aren't going to get boring and just, you know, uh, she gave this phenomenal talk about it's a plant party and just how do you eat if you're a vegetarian or vegan? Like we're going to give you some things that are a different perspective to how you can succeed because that's what this is about. It's about trying your best. Some days are better than others. Slip, don't slide. And this is a continuum, a lifelong journey. And how do we help you to to live it in a way that's not boring and that you will have um, sustainable results? Absolutely. All right. Well, 
This has been awesome. This episode been one in the books. In the books. We will see you all next time for episode two. We're going to get into some bariatric basics next time. Please follow us on Instagram. We're at Dr. X Dietitian, and we are the Dr. Dietitian Collab. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, guys. See you next time.